Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us. Hi everyone, just wanted to let you know that we have another Zoom paint-along party uh, happening on June 1st at 7 p.m. Eastern. And you can register by using the QR code that you see here on the screen. We are doing a theme this time that is where you're most paint-ridden, dingiest clothes that you paint in, and we want to see those. Jean Peterson is my co-host, and we look forward to seeing you. I'll be doing an oil painting with my palette knife, and Jean's uh, demo is a bit of a surprise, so join us. Don't forget to register. Seats are limited. Use the QR code. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome okay. to our chat. I'm Linda riesenberg Fissler. I'm your host today. And I'm really kind of excited because I have my first Australian artist on the, the podcast, uh, Fiona Smith, who is joining us from Sydney, Australia. Welcome, Fiona. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'm glad we can hook up. Uh, we have a lot of common interests, naturally art being one of them, but also uh, you have a history in journalism and writing, which I also write as well. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell me about your journey. You went from journalism to art, and I want to know what piqued your interest in all of this. Well, it's it's a it's a very familiar story, I think, to um, to a lot of women in the arts. In that, uh, I started off with an interest in art, and um, you know, as a young woman leaving school. I had the impression that that there was no way I could make a living as an artist. I, I didn't see it around me. Um, my mother was an artist. She was a potter, but she didn't make a great deal of money for it. It was more that, you know, she, she'd make a, a little bit of extra money for Christmas presents and that sort of stuff through her, her pottery. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't really sort of fund our family in any way. Um, so I went off and studied journalism instead. And uh, when I came back from, from my university studies, I took night classes and weekend classes at a very good art school in Sydney um, called the Julian Ashton Art School. And it had a very sort of traditional kind of academic approach to painting, um, while a lot of the, the big art schools were doing conceptual sort of work. And uh, I did that while I was working as a journalist and then I went travelling overseas. I went backpacking around the world for 13 months and when I came back I had a debt and a beautiful Turkish rug that I had to pay off. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to have to, to dig in here and start making some money and pay off my debts. And I spent 20 years writing um, instead of painting. And then kids grew older, didn't need me around so much, I was working part-time, so I was sort of balancing the family and the work kind of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, started going back to art classes again, and probably about 10 years ago, I think, started going back to art classes again and sort of relaunched into a new career from there. That's the the shorthand version of it. <laughs> but um, I, th I think if you look way back, you know, to because I'm, you know, I'm 60 now, 60, yeah. uh, 60 or 61, I forget, um, so if you look way back, sorry, I'm just putting my tea down, um, way back to where I grew up. I, I did grow up in, um, in a family where everybody did things with their hands. Um, my mother was like a 1960s style feminist who didn't think that, that my sister and I as girls should be playing with dolls. So instead of giving us dolls, we had as much paper as we could possibly destroy and we had paints and dad made us an easel and we spent all our time sort of doodling and painting and that sort of stuff playing around with mum's clay in the backyard that sort of thing so you know if, if you go way back I guess I'd always been making things everybody in my family made things um and I probably that's where it started oh that sounds like a wonderful childhood so Although, did you miss not yeah, playing with a doll? There was a lot to be yeah. hmm? did, you, did you miss not playing with a doll? <laughs> I did. did I did. And in fact, some of our, um, some of our uh, sort of neighbourhood friends, their, their mothers would feel sorry for, for us. And then <laughs> I remember there was one family 
nearby and um, this girl, Denise, she had so many dolls <laughs> and her mum said, oh, give that little Fiona a doll. So she hunted around, she found the rattiest doll she could find and she <laughs> gave me this doll. And then I spent all this time doing it up and putting texture on its face and making it look beautiful and and that sort of stuff until she wanted it back again. But um, my mother later claimed that that she didn't let us play with dolls because we used to, I don't know if you had the, well, you would have had the Adams Family. It was an American program. Yeah. You did. remember the Adams Family? Mm -hmm. And, and so she claimed we used to rip the heads off dolls and play with them, <laughs> play with the headless dolls, finger puppets with the dolls' heads. But I, I think really it. she had that, <laughs> I think she really had that that view that was quite prevalent at the time. Um, it was sort of like an earlier understanding of, of you know, gender and, and feminism that, that girls and boys were pretty much the same, you know, in a in a lot of ways, and that you shouldn't bring them up with great differences. So, you know, the idea is that girls should be able to play with Lego or toy trucks if they wanted to, and all the rest of it. But the problem for mum is my sister and I just turned into these ultra feminine little girls. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm sure she still loved you. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it's kind of interesting hearing hearing your background because it's somewhat similar. Um, I was, I mean, my mother always bought me Barbies, but I was the one that was always playing football with the kids, with the guy guys out on the street, you know, so um, it was me and another friend who was also a female, we were like the first two picks on the football teams and American football teams. And, um, you, you know, so it went on from there. As a matter of fact, in high school, real quick little story, in, in high school, um, I actually got my friend, boyfriend, not like my boyfriend boyfriend but just a friend who was a boy that played on the street picked me first over his girlfriend in high school gym and that caused like world war three <laughs> it was like why didn't you pick me i'm your girlfriend and it was just like you don't understand he knows what i can do as far as playing football i mean it was like you know a whole week went by <laughs> with them arguing over this so but yeah it was uh, i was probably not feminine enough for my mother so um, yeah, there you go. Mm. <laughs> so, mm. um, well, so, you know, nobody ever picked me for a sporting team. I was like the worst person at sports. Uh, this story, <laughs> I, I still remember it clearly. And it must have been when I was in kindergarten, which is like, you know, the, the first year of, of primary school here. Yeah. And uh, I was taken for my first sports carnival and they'd laid out all the lanes for the running track. Mm. And I didn't understand. And because... We we had this, it would seem like a fairly idyllic childhood sort of, because we lived right next to a national park and there were bush and trees and animals and birds everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I I just had this slightly different way of doing things. Anyway, I remember the, the starting gun going off and, you know, in our household, we didn't run, we galloped. <laughs> and when we galloped, I'm sorry, I can hear my dog in the background. When we galloped, for some reason or other, we would always sing the William Tell overture at the top of our voices, you know. Oh, we must have heard it in so here we go da 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 and so I started on this running race sort of da, 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 galloping along and everybody else is running and I realised that I was behind everybody else and I thought I must be in the wrong lane so I go into another lane da, 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 da. and no I'm still in the wrong lane and then find another lane I just completely clueless and things never really improved from there <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. I love the story. <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. Um, so tell us a little bit. Let's, I guess we should probably like stop exchanging childhood stories. We'll be here all night. Uh, but, uh, let's talk a little bit about your art. Um, behind you are mm -hmm. some of the, I, I think this is your most recent series, the bird series that you're doing, avian yes. series. Yeah. So tell us a little bit. Yes. How does that start? Yeah. And, and um, you know, any concepts that you want to share with us with it? Yeah, sure. Um, so it started when when I started back at art classes again. It was during a time where where um, my mother had just been diagnosed with cancer, and she had this one year period between when she was diagnosed and when she finally died. And it was coincidentally when I went back to art class, and 
I was full of grief. You know, my mother and I were were incredibly close and I'd turn up to the art classes thinking, I don't know what to do. You know, I'd such a long time since I'd painted, how do I paint a tree? Where do I start? Blah, blah, blah. But I would just lose myself in this frenzy of paint where I'd, I'd turn up and I'd feel absolutely dead inside and exhausted from sort of working, looking after the family and worrying about my mum. And I'd emerge after like two and a half hours in this painting class completely refreshed um, and, and revived. And then I could go and see my mum with whatever I'd been doing in the, in the art class and we could talk about the painting instead of talking about her illness. It gave us something else to to concentrate on, which was a really good thing. But at that time, when I, I, I started painting, it was more about um, capturing things that I was afraid of losing because I've got a terrible memory. I've always had a really atrocious memory. Can't remember, you know, people will talk about things that happened when I was at school and I'm like it's never even happened. In fact, that that backpacking trip I did for 30 months around the world, I was wondering the other day, you know, was that really worth doing? Because I remember so little of it. <laughs> but it but anyway, so so when I first started, my subject matter was all um based around uh things that I wanted to keep. It was around um growing up in Church Point and you know the outskirts of Sydney and that life we had there was about my children. It was about holding things close and being afraid to let go. Mm -hmm. And then um, over a period of time, over the next few years, you know, I was experimented, experimenting with different subject matters. I was staging exhibitions with my friends, just organising themselves. And there was one exhibition that I did and I had I had probably three or four different kind of bird paintings in there, but one of them was a picture of a magpie, which is um, a beautiful, very common, but very beautiful Australian magpie. It's quite tall and very elegant, black and white. And I had it with a patterned background because I hadn't known what to do with the background. And I had this rug at home with a William Morris pattern on it. It's it's called the acanthus pattern and it's all these big, curvy leaves and that sort of thing. So um, I had this uh, uh, painting of the magpie and I put that pattern behind it and changed the colours and everything. And when I put it in the exhibition, people actually fought over it to buy it. And, you know, that's one of those moments where you <laughs> thought, oh, okay, that struck a chord. I'll have to do some more. Mm -hmm. And so I started painting magpies and it started off with the magpies and I just... I couldn't paint enough to keep up with demand. There was just such a connection that people have with that bird um, that ge generally it would be people saying, oh, I love those birds or my mum always painted those birds or they remind me of my dad or, you know, there was this this, this very strong connection between Australians and, and this bird, which is part of our everyday life because mm -hmm. um, they live all around us. Um, and so it sort of developed from there and then you get sick of painting the same, painting the same <laughs> bird all the time and you start going into different birds and pushing the, the envelope out and, and changing what you do with it. So to start with, I was thinking, well, why am I painting all these birds inside? You know, these are outside birds. What's the rationale for it? And then I have... Um, uh, a dear friend who's who's a fantastic artist, an artist called Lucy Cullerton, and she's very successful here in Australia. And she just said, "Well, you know, they're um, what did she say? She she said, oh, well, they're they're domestic birds. You know, they're around us all the time. Of course, they'd be inside.' And I thought, well, okay, if she's giving me the tick of approval, I can keep <laughs> doing that. So it's it's been um, it's been an exploration. Um, the paintings now have developed into, they're not just about the birds, but they're about um, making connections with the viewer. So um, often they will have objects in them that I recall from my own childhood. So they tend to be sort of like things that you might have seen in the 1960s and 1970s. So there might have even been things that might have belonged to your, your grandparents, but they spark a memory in people and 
so so they're connecting with the the subject of the painting of the with the bird but they're mm -hmm. also connecting with the object that the bird might be sitting on or the pattern behind it and it's it's yeah it's it's now i guess what what has happened is over this journey these paintings have been about building a connection between me and um the thing that i create and the viewer right wonderful so I was just thinking of, of that is not only are you making connection to what you're creating, but you're causing this relationship of connection between the viewer and and their past or present, depending on the age, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it's really kind of interesting from that standpoint, because that's one of the things that we want to do as artists is reach out and, and touch people. So it sounds like in just in the the what, 20 minutes that we've been talking and, and prior to this, before I started actually the show, there was so much that we had in common and we're, we're around the world from one another, you know? So mm. I think that's marvelous. Do you, do you have a lot of the, the folks that, that see these make comments of, oh, my grandmother had that or my mother had that or, you know, I've got that same pattern in my house or? All the time. Yeah. All the time. It's, it's, um, it's quite astounding, you know, in a way. I, I was thinking last night, because sometimes when I'm painting, you know, you when I'm not listening to podcasts, you know, your mind is churning over things. And one of the things my mind churns over is, you know, what is it about birds and humans? What's this relationship we have? And why are people so drawn to these depictions of, of birds? And there's so many factors that go into it. I think one factor, which is a really practical one, is, you know, if you have a bird around you, you know, whether it's a macaw or a magpie or, you know, a blue jay in, in the US, <laughs> each one pretty much looks the same. So I can paint a picture of a magpie and everybody sees their magpie. And these, these birds will live for 20, 25 years. So when I was growing up, um in in church point we had a family of magpies that i swear went all the way through my earliest memories of childhood till i pretty much left university it was in the same family the same mum and dad and the kids and you know yeah so the relationships you build with these birds are very very close they become part of your extended family but when you see a picture of them it's not like um, a picture of a dog where there are, you know, you see uh, a picture of a Labrador and you know it's not your Labrador. You know, the the birds are more similar, you know, um, to each other. Um, so so you kind of cross that that barrier, you know. Um, somebody could somebody, for instance, could send me a photo of their bird and say, "I want a picture of my bird." I could pull it you know, a, a picture of, of same breed of bird from the internet and put it in a different situation, they won't know that it's not their bird. <laughs> True. <laughs> because the differences between them are so slight. Right. So I think I think that's one reason. But there is something else that's that's very deeply ingrained in in humans that's that's prehistoric about our fascination and and the 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 meaning that we build in to birds mm -hmm. and and how people you know you you ask whether 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 people say to me oh you know that reminds me of my mother the amount of people who will say every time I see this particular bird I think it's my mum or I think it's my dad or it's you know grandma come back to visit us or or right. that sort of stuff right. it doesn't matter right. how atheistic you are or non-spiritual there's still that like oh you know that you know every time I see a, a, a raven up in the mountains I think of my mum mm -hmm. it's not that she particularly liked ravens but it's just a connection somehow that I've, right. I've made with that bird right and I think that's that's always been with us yeah. I was looking last night I'm sorry I'm, I'm rabbiting on a bit no, no, but fine. That's fine. I was looking at um <laughs> last night the earliest written story that we have as humans is mm -hmm. is the are these stone tablets from mesopotamia called uh the epic of gilgamesh mm -hmm. and in that um in those amongst those stone tablets 
is the original story of Noah's Ark. Mm. And so you have the hero who, um, you know, there's a huge flood that's been sent down by the gods because they had multiple at that time, mm -hmm. a huge flood. And so he, you know, piles all the animals and birds into a big boat and then he sends out three birds, one after the other. Mm -hmm. I think in the Bible there were only two and he sends out three. Um, and, you know, to start with, they keep coming back because there's nowhere to land because the water's still too high. And then the third one, which I think is a raven, um, circles around and doesn't come back. So it's obviously found somewhere that's safe to land. And so the guy who, who's the hero of the story realises it's safe for everybody to come out of the boat mm. kind of thing. Um, so that is 5,000 years old, that story. Wow. And... You know, even even back then, people were using birds to describe, you know, that the, they have this relationship between the messages between the outside world or, or the supernatural and, and the world we inhabit here on Earth. And mm -hmm. they've always had this very special role in our imagination and our storytelling. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at... Um allegory, if you will, uh, tarot cards, um, Celtic cards, whatever type of card, there's always some bird, <laughs> one, at least one bird that is, you know, represented in that. And I, I don't know, there's always the word freedom keeps popping in my mind, you know, like they, they're free, they can fly, they can, you know, their main goal when we, when we actually look at it is feeding their youth, youth you know, the babies, eggs, sitting on the nest, etc. Um, and they have a lot more probably responsibility than we think they have, but that's what we see them. We see them flying around and, and that just seems to be that, that freedom that we all would like to have, um, without going into deeper thought of really what they're trying to do and that's survive. You know? So yeah, so interesting connections through, through that whole series that you're, you're finding. So. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know where that series is going to end because I keep thinking, ah, there's something else that I'd like to paint. Mm -hmm. And then I just don't get the time to do that something else. You know, I'm thinking that by the end of the year, I might try and like carve out a month where I can do this other thing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, it's just like the birds are developing, you know, they're, they're, um, Every, every time I think, uh, because everything is a challenge with painting these, for me, for, for painting these um, pictures. And um, so the challenge might be is I'll, I'll look at a, a piece of cloth and think, oh, I'd really like to get better at painting materials. So I'll put a bird in the middle of a pile of cloth, or, <laughs> you know, or if there's something sort of gold and reflective and I think, oh, I'd really like to get into painting that and and you know, getting some sort of mastery over painting that, then I'll find a way to put a bird in it. So I, you know, right. so that keeps me interested as well. Yeah, well, I wanted to jump real quick to your, to mm -hmm. talk about your website, um, FionaSmithArt.com, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, she has a, a lot of, an interesting website and um, I've been poking through it, uh, trying to get to know Fiona a little better before I started talking with her. Um, she's got a news section, she has prints available. She talks about her commissions. There's a, a page about her as well as her um, gallery contact. Are you only represented in Australia, Fiona, or do you actually? I actually, I actually have gallery in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, okay. Which is, I've just sent them some paintings. Um, and they found me on Instagram. So all of the opportunities I've had since I first started painting have all come via social media, mostly Instagram. So I've been, I every now and then I'll, I'll send them a bunch of paintings and, you know, roll them up on loose canvas and ship them over there, which is good. Yeah. Right. So it's it's just one of those things that gave me a bit of a kick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great. I think it's wonderful. If I ever get over to Baton Rouge, I'll make sure I drop by that gallery and say, I talked to her. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, we talked about this earlier, um, is uh, tell us a little bit about the art market in Australia. Um, I know from a, a conversation or actually email that we shared uh, that 
I think there's some similarities. But before we get into that comment, I'd like to hear your perception. And I'll note that it is your perception. I, I'm going to be talking to Christine Davis, who lives on the other side of Australia in Adelaide, uh, who is an artist there. And I'm going to be talking to her and I'm going to kind of ask her the same question, although she told me she doesn't want to talk about that. <laughs> but um doesn't stop me. So <laughs> one of the things that that I like for you to do is is tell us a little bit. I mean, you know, we know what it's like. Most of my audience is American, so they kind of know what the art market is like here. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the Australian art market. Okay, well, I guess the first thing to know is the size of our populations is um, is vastly different. So I think you've got three hundred and thirty million people in the US. And I think we have about 25 million. Um, so that means generally that there's a lot less money swishing around um, to be spent on art. Um, but on the other hand, it means that you're not elbowing your way through quite as many other competitive artists as well. So, you know, uh, probably you you might think that that for somebody who's who's in the same kind of part of the market as me, it's probably pretty similar. If you're at the top end of, of the art market, you know, and, and your work is selling in auctions, um, it will be vastly different. I think last year, the top price of an Australian artist um, in, at an auction was, I think, $2.5 million. And I would imagine in the US, uh, top American artists' work would probably be selling in the, I would imagine, tens of millions at least um so yeah, it, it, it actually those, depends. <laughs> yeah so so there are those differences it's also said that that if you're a talented young artist and you're you're um starting out it is probably easier to make a living when you're in the US i've i've seen that written i don't know how true that is but if you you know, get accepted by a gallery straight out of art school and you're seen as a hot young thing, um, in Australia, you still won't be able to make a living. I mean, your your first paintings will still be selling in the hundreds of dollars rather than the thousands of dollars. Um, aside, aside from that, I, I think um, being part of a smart, smaller market can sometimes make you more nimble. Um, so... Uh, I can see some things happening with uh, the art galleries here in Australia, and I don't know whether they're having the same impact, th those sorts of things are having the same sort of impact in the US. So, for instance, um, online sales of art are really a big thing here in Australia, and it used to be thought that People wouldn't buy art online. They need to see it in person. But people have shown themselves extremely willing to buy art online. In fact, during COVID, I think visual artists had the best year ever in Australia um, because everybody was stuck at home looking at their empty walls and they weren't <laughs> spending their money on travelling. So they started decorating, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, We've had in Australia uh, a business startup called Blue Thumb, which is an online art gallery, which is now huge and has had a major impact on um, art buying, particularly for people who are just starting out or who may not be full-time painters, mm -hmm. although there are, you know, people who make a really good living from Blue Thumb sales um, alone. Um the art galleries, some of the art galleries have really sort of rethought their business model. And so uh, there's one that I'm connected with, um, the Michael Reed Group, and they sell fantastically online. So I've had a couple of solo shows with one of their galleries, which is out in a rural area, but I swear that probably very few people actually go and see the paintings in person and... Mm -hmm. Of the paintings that I've sold there, I would say probably close to 100% have actually been sold online rather than from people going into the gallery. Wow. Um, so from that point of view, I think, yeah, it's it's kind of nimble. Um, I think, you know, and, and this is just my perception only, 
again, because it's a smaller market, I think people who are doing stuff that's re that's really interesting can have an outside, outside effect on what everybody else does. So I think over the last probably four or five years, still lives has become a really, really popular sort of genre in, in painting in Australia. And if you look at what is selling through all the galleries, there's still lives absolutely everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, possibly because there were some really, really talented artists who were doing beautiful work and people could see that there was interest in it and it was selling. And so all of a sudden there's just a flood of people doing still life work. So I think, you know, that could also be part of being, you know, part of a smaller population and a smaller market. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 interesting. I think in the US I get a sense that um, there is more a taste, taste for more challenging experimental work than there would be in Australia. I think in Australia people are still very... Um, focused on stuff that is you know that's attractive to look at mm -hmm. um less <laughs> likely to buy challenging work yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I think I think I think we're, what we're talking about is a difference in economy of scale for example like mm. you have pockets of plain air painters here in the U.S. and classical realism and representational art up to mixed media and abstract art. Um, along with that, we have, and I don't know if this is maybe true for Australia as well, but we have very definite silos of artists, if you will. So if you're in the plain air group, you know all the plain air masters, if you will, uh, those who are doing the workshops and uh, have, a, have a number of followers and um, you know, want to paint like them, that it, you know, one way. Uh, and just like you have a classical mm. realist, who's people, artists who are interested in in doing that and following those masters. Um, and then you have the whole, if you will, the New York City artist group, which is you know the very much um, abstract, uh, contemporary, modern, if you want to use that word. Which you know to me are mm. all adjectives. It, you still have to know yeah. the focus and the foundation of things, um, but mm. and it's like never shall they overlap. It's if I were sitting in New York talking with an artist who's known in New York City and is selling very well, and I say to them, "Do you know this artist who is very well known in in the plain air world and um, you know it, it, where the plain air." painters paint, which is all over America, including New York City, that person may not know that person. So definitely a difference when you start looking at population, um, probably very different when you start looking at the number of artists in your country versus the number of artists in the U.S. I mean, it's like 1.2 million people consider themselves artists in the United States. Um, and that figure was probably five years old. It's probably more than that now. Um, I don't know how that figure relates to Australia, for example. No, I've got no figures for you, for you there. Okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I just kicked the camera there. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. And and there there's a question about okay, what does consider yourself an artist mean? Um, right. So before I started painting again. Um, I always knew in the back of my mind, I had this little, these two words that seemed to be linked together, which was frustrated artist, you know, <laughs> and that's how I saw myself. I was a journalist, I was a mother, I was a daughter, I was a wife, and I was a frustrated artist. So, yeah, yeah I, I guess no. you know, <laughs> if, you were to, if you were to ask, you know, people on Instagram, how many people consider themselves as an artist, you probably end up with many, many more millions, you know, okay. <laughs> of all the people who, who do all sorts of other things in their lives. And then they, you know, once a week create something and put it on Instagram and right. they're still artists. Right. So any any signs of like 
um, the silos that I talk about, like there's there's the group that kind of hangs together here and here. I, 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 I suspect because, um, again, because of the population difference, we have far fewer commercial art galleries um, okay. and public art galleries. So there's probably a little less of a, a silo because it doesn't matter what sort of art you're doing, if you want to sell, you'll still be interested in looking at what the good commercial art galleries are doing. So you come across each other's work there. Um, yeah, it, it, it it may those silos may grow in the future. You know, there there is more of a trend of people bypassing the gallery system altogether. And as they do that, you might find that those silos sort of that silofication, if there's such a word, <laughs> intensifies right. um, because there will be less of a, a meeting ground between them. Um, it was interesting as an in, I I went to a um, a gathering probably uh, three months or so ago, um, and it was like some people from the art industry who were being interviewed. And afterwards, all of the audience who are all artists, because it was all about sort of the art industry, mm -hmm. they all gathered in the foyer and they couldn't stop talking to each other. And I thought to myself, how ridiculous that all of these people are desperate to talk to other artists and there's no forum for us to do that. So I set up a group on Facebook called uh, the Artist Lunch Club. And we've been having these occasional meetings and we had a studio visit with one of the artists the other day. And it's just such a hunger out there for that connection between people just to have conversations about the use of materials and who sell, you know, which galleries to deal with and which ones not to, and how do you deal with this particular problem? And, you know, all of those sorts of things that you can't have with other people it's just such a hunger for that kind of connection yeah yeah and I see that here as well I mean you see a lot of um probably not to the extent that that hunger isn't as I don't know your stomach isn't as empty is that is that how you say would say yeah. that but um because we can I, America isn't um shy about hooking up and talking about whatever your interests are and um you know, certainly yeah. there's there are a number of artists um, and a number of ways that you can connect. Um, one of which we started, I started a um, an association, uh, my co-founder and I, called Artistic Harmonies Association. And one of our goals is that, you know, we break down these silos that, you know, art is art. And, you know, we want people to explore the different facets of it and, and try to get some understanding. So, uh, there's a, a show that we do, or uh, actually it's a Zoom party that we do. So very similar to your Facebook group, we we just took it to Zoom and do a chat creating cocktails. So uh, we have a couple artists demoing, um, a lot of artists come in and, and ask questions and uh, get information that way. So I, I, and I really think that COVID set us back, um, not just here in the US, I'm talking worldwide, where you know we've been so isolated for so long that now we're kind of crawling out from that shell and it's kind of like gosh I miss that camaraderie of talking to someone who understands the frustrations that I'm going through while I'm creating so mm -hmm. yeah I, I guess yeah I, I don't know I don't I don't know that in Australia well I, I in Australia it's harder to find those physical groups to get together, I think, unless you're involved in like uh, an art school or a sketch club or, or that sort of thing. But I guess, you, you know, your comments were taking to where I meant to go before I waylaid myself, which I often do, um, which was, you know, with this this Facebook group that I've set up, we, we do have in-person catch-ups, which I think are valuable, but they're from all sorts of different disciplines. So there'll be a ceramic artist, there's a sculptor, there's, you know, somebody who carves wood, there's plenty of painters, you know, yeah. um, that yeah. sort of thing. So in a way that does also break down those silos. But, yeah, yeah that, that that wasn't so much the attention. It was just like there's this unmet need 
you know, mm-hmm. for people to to actually meet each other and support each other and inspire yeah. each other. It's really kind of interesting too, because I think in some ways, and I'll probably catch a lot of comments saying that it isn't true, but I see a lot of times where um, some artists and people will go completely the opposite way and not want to be approached or talked to. And it's not from the stage of this is my work and I don't want anybody to see it. It's just maybe it's too much stimulation. You know, it's kind of like they, they would get um, waylaid <laughs> for a word away yeah. from what it is that they're um, studying or, or what it is they're trying to achieve. And, you know, I think that sometimes that can even be perceived wrongfully, you know, that it's, you know, Mm -hmm. oh, I don't like talking to that artist because they never say anything or they think what they got is too precious. (laughs) I've heard so many comments like this before and it's, and it's not true. It's just that they're just not comfortable in, in being that open. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not that they think Mm -hmm. that their work's any precious than anything else is. It's more of a, a comfort zone, comfort zone that they want to sit in. Um, mm. I've seen that as well. I, I think the more I, you know, the the deeper I, I sort of delve into this whole thing about the art market and being an artist and that sort of thing, the more I realize that there are just so many ways of being an artist. You know, mm. as, as many as, you know, so many ways of existing and none is better than another you know and and nothing is wrong you know there's there's no wrong way of being an artist I think I so agree um and it's very exciting and every time another sort of false belief falls you know it's like this you know <laughs> pack of cards and every now and then something you always thought was true and it falls and you sit there and think wow you know <laughs> like yeah. that whole thing about you know, at a certain period of time, I remember, like, lots of artists were told, never use black, you right. know, that you exactly. should always make your own colours, never use black and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody will come and say, I use black, and you see what they do, and they use it beautifully, and it's very effective, and there's another card's fallen down, and you sit and think, well, that rule doesn't exist, you know. Exactly. So, and yeah. I think that's exciting. Yeah, I do too. Um, I had a, a, one of the demonstrations that we did, um, I was doing a, a mixing of glorious greens because it's springtime here. It's, you know, we're the upper mm. part of the <laughs> of the earth. And, um, you know, all these beautiful greens are coming out. So I, I took, I did a demo where I was demonstrating, um, we work from a limited palette, uh, you know, blue, yellow, red. And I said, you know, but mm. don't think that you always have to use ultramarine blue. So I took five different blues, five different yellows, and was mixing those together to get these different greens. And then I blew their mind because I put black on there and mixed it with yellow. Got this gorgeous landscape green. And they were just like, well, we're not allowed to use black. No, no, no. <laughs> You're allowed to use black. <laughs> and and I had another yeah. artist on uh, on the show who basically said there are no rules. And it, the whole show was about the rules of painting, creating a painting. And, and she first yeah. thing that the person said was there, there are no rules. And it was just like, <laughs> yeah the mind blew up we didn't know what else we were going to say after that that point but it was it was really kind of interesting um well that kind of means that everything that you say might be true for you and it might be true for you right now but it doesn't mean it's true for anybody else right. or that it'll be true for you tomorrow right and it's um yeah it is it's I, I guess one thing that I, I I like the idea of is break the rules but break them intentionally I, mm-hmm. I like that but then maybe that's not true either <laughs> maybe maybe that's just an idea that I'm going to play with tomorrow right that doesn't work for anybody else right but and I think that I mean when you were talking about it, your group that has all of the different uh artists there the sculptors the ceramicists the, the different things that it, it what amazes me is is a lot of times the the spark of creation that happens when someone else is talking about their work and then you might have this extension of their thought that mm. ends up being something totally different in a painting. Um, mm. But, you know, maybe as well as you know, you're also a writer like I am, maybe that sparks something for an idea of, a, I don't know, an article you want to write for a painting magazine or a, a fictional book that you want to start writing, um, you know, all of that kind of, of 
creation that can come out of that just mm. small collaboration that happens. It's just amazing. Mm. That whole idea about creativity and innovation and where it comes from. When I when I was working um, as a journalist, so so for twenty years or so, I worked for uh, the Australian Financial Review, which is like the Wall Street Journal, but it's our smaller, less well funded <laughs> version because <laughs> we have a small population. Um, and the area I ended up working in was um, I ended up being the editor of this section called Workspace, which was all about. Uh, human psychology, how we work, um, how to get the best from what we do, um, or anything to do with the human dimension of working, which I found really interesting. It was one of those areas I sort of tumbled into almost by mistake because somebody else said, you know, back from maternity leave, you can have this job. And it was like, Wah. and I it ended up being something that really suited me because I was always really interested in, you know, how the brain works and how people work. But one of the areas I loved writing about was that whole area of innovation and where does it come from? And, you know, innovation is creativity and how um, a lot of the great innovations that we've had, whether they're technological or, or whatever, have been by throwing two things that don't belong together, two or three things that don't belong together, you throw them together and they something sticks or it doesn't stick, you know, yeah. it's it's like throwing a bunch of magnets together they either repel or they cling or mm -hmm. um and I think the same kind of thing works in an art where you can you can say well I'm going to throw this together with that and just see what happens and it's it's like it's like the spark of an idea and I was I was thinking about um artificial intelligence the other day and thinking about well you know how can that be used because a lot of the the AI art at the moment is just is horrible. <laughs> it's just you know, it's it's a bit like uh, a lot of the NFT art, and it's just like <laughs> right, right, yeah. But I started playing around with it, and I had um, I had a painting that I'd done of a black swan on a plastic chair with 1970s orange floral wallpaper behind it. And I really liked the painting and how it worked out. So I thought, well, I'll put, feed that into an AI software and see what it comes up with. And it came up with, you know, various versions of generally a black swan sitting on top of the back of a plastic chair and it, none of them looked any good. But I thought to myself, this is going to get better and better and better. And it could actually be used as a way to spark ideas. And it's not that necessarily you would use AI to create a piece of art but you could say oh well um, I'm feeling a bit sort of dry of ideas today what happens if I throw together a uh, plastic truck with um, some lemons and you know and mm -hmm. feed that into the the software mm -hmm. and just see the variety of things that it's sort of spurts out right. and something there might might be the genesis of an idea that you can take further. Right. David Bowie used to do something very similar with his lyrics. And um, I remember reading about this a uh, very long time ago. But I know that when he was writing lyrics, he used to cut up, um, I don't know whether it was his lyrics or poems or bits from the paper or whatever, and put them all in front and rearrange them and, he used that as a way of, you know, generating ideas. And I think, you know, potentially we could use AI the same way. Yeah, there was an interesting um, program. And now I can't remember if it was 60 Minutes or if it was another one of these news uh, programs that are on here. Um, but they did talk about AI and they gave them, I was actually talking to my friend who's a um, screenwriter and, and director out in L.A., and it was interesting, he was asking me about AI and I was telling him about the story uh, um, and the guy fed it like 10 words and based on all the different algorithms that they had built inside the artificial intelligence, it came back with a three paragraph story that they then showed to a focus group uh, of people and got a multitude of reactions to it from tears to smiles to, you know, all different things just from 10 words. 
and using all of the different, how do people react to this particular word or that particular word and the placement of that word in a sentence. Um, and then they went back to the AI software and they told them they wanted it written in a poem and it spit it out, you know, seconds later in this poem, which they then shared. And again, it, it went from um, people who had miscarriage uh, and the loss of that child uh, mm. was brought into this this poem that had nothing. It never said baby. It never said miscarriage. It never said loss of a child or anything in it. But there were these connections that were being made. And um, it was first it struck me as scary <laughs> because as a writer, I'm like, well, well there goes my job. <laughs> and then as an artist, it's like, wow, um, am I going to be replaced as, as somebody that can bring creative ideas forward? Um, but the the person actually that was at the you know the the president of the company that's searching into this was basically saying it's not ready yet for consumption by everybody in the world uh, it's got a long way yeah. to go it has a lot of problems yet that we need to iron out so <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah I mean it is coming and it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that affects yeah I'm with you it's 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 kind of both mind-blowing and frightening at the same time. Yeah. I guess my perspective is it's coming, so yeah. we have to find ways of dealing with it and um, uh, pretending that it, that it's it's not, that it's too hard yeah. isn't really going to help. So we have to yeah. find ways of making it useful. At the moment, it's, I mean, the quality isn't, isn't good enough. I mean, when I... I've played around with um, chat GPT, you know, because I want to see what it can do. And so I still do a little bit of writing. I've got one um, journalism client left that I do very little work for. Um, and I did an interview the other day. And so I, I basically fed it into chat GPT and said, you know, write me an article based on the information on this, blah, 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 blah. And it's still not good. Like, no, it, nowhere good enough to be able to, you know, to use commercially to to sell anyone because the um, at the moment there the software isn't able to have the understanding of what is the most important part of this story. What does the client yeah. want? What do the readers want? Um, how do you write it well? It's still really, really at a at a basic level in terms right. of writing. But I, I know that things will go ahead in leaps and bounds, you know, um, as they did. I, I kind of feel like it's going to have an impact on the world pretty much like the internet did, you know. If you remember what it was like when we first had the internet and everybody's going, what's this internet thing? Mm -hmm. And I still remember asking my my brother about can you explain it to me? Because he was an IT person and um, I was a journalist working on typewriters still at that stage. Can you explain it to me? And I had this vision in my head that you would go to a computer screen and it'd be like the universe, you know, and you'd have to like, you know, go through some sort of portal. I had no concept of what it was. That, but, that you know, works. if you think about how that's changed everything. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say your version of it reminded me more of Mighty Python than it actually, you know, than, than it did. So, uh, yeah, so I had um, no concept. Yeah, I. The weird thing was, is I worked at. Um, I don't know if you guys have Proc Procter and Gamble. If there's any subsidiaries down yes. there, and, and there is. Okay, so I worked for Procter and Gamble for 26 years, um, and I grew up with computers. So my started working with computers when I started working at PNG and, you know, got us to where we are today. So, you know, it, it that fear wasn't as bad as um, some of the other fears of what we're now getting into. Um, mm. And and then, you know, when I look at the impact of the internet, um, lots of good there, but also lots of bad. So it's, you know, it, 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 to me, the internet is still in its infancy. Um, maybe going yeah. into its young preteen years <laughs> yet, but it's uh, yeah. There's there's a lot that you know. I'll just sign up for and say right at right ahead that I don't know about, like, like staying away from the dark web, doing all of the the really bad stuff that's out there. Um, so I think it's a curse and a blessing in some ways. Um, 
I think it's a blessing in that I get to talk with artists from around the world and and find out about what mm. their life's like um, and what their art life is like there. So um, we've been chatting for about an hour. Um, I wanted to touch on one thing before we wrap up, and that was there is on your website, again, fionasmithart.com, there's a, a, an article in the news area that I read and really identified with and really appreciated, and it was called The Trouble with Headlines. And I have it open here. And one of the things that you talk about is that in a 2019 survey of women representation in galleries found that only about 25% of exhibited works at the National Gallery of Australia were by women. And one of the areas that Artistic Harmonies is looking at um, with me being the president and me being a woman uh, is the inequality of um, representation of women in the arts. And I'm not just talking about artists in general, but uh, meaning visual artists, I'm talking about all artists in general, uh, creative musicians, um, you know, painters, ceramists, sculptors, writers, <laughs> and the list can go on and on, singers. Um, so is that, is it that prevailing? I mean, do you see a lot of it in Australia as well as, as we do? I mean, it is here in the U.S. We know it is. Uh, I could probably mm -hmm. cite very many studies as well, but can you talk a little bit about that? Is there, do you see any improvement happening or is it just kind of that's the way it is and everybody kind of accepts it. It's, uh, I do see improvement. Um, yeah. and, and part of the improvement is, uh, you know, th their uh, social actions. So, you know, there, there have been campaigns um, on, on various things from sort of sexual harassment at work to, you know, know my name kind of campaigns to, to, uh, to get to know female artists who were unrepresented before or had been forgotten about. So that sort of thing happens. But in terms of gender inequality, uh, Australia's culture is said to be more macho than the culture in both the UK and the US. And mm. uh, having written a fair bit about sort of gender in inequality in the past, Part of the reasoning for that is supposedly part of our history because, you know, such um, a large percentage of our original uh, colonial settlers were men. So, so they were shipped, far more people shipped over as prisoners on, on boats right. from the UK were, were men than women. So when Australia first set up as a colony, uh, women were in very short supply. In fact, they ended up having to basically import a whole lot of uh, women from Ireland who came out to work as um, household help and, and that sort of thing because there weren't enough women around. But the attitudes that developed as a result of having so few women in the colony to start with they, they they kind of filter through to modern day Australia. And I know that certainly in the business community, um, there was a, one particularly famous case where an American executive came over to, I think he was one of the, the top three at one of our major banks. And he came over to one of their big sort of executive meetings and came in and just said, where are all the women, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because he was exhausted in the US mm -hmm. to at least having some representation of women in these right. top executive meetings. And Australia's improved a lot. Um, but I do notice in terms of the arts, even though um, women artists in Australia are selling exceptionally well. If you look at the commercial galleries and the solo shows and um, how much work, because because women are the main buyers of art in Australia, I would say. I mean, that's my perception. Got no figures to big it up. But um, certainly in terms of the buyers of my art, vast majority of women. Um, mm. So we, as consumers of art, we want art that we can relate to. And art that we can relate to is often painted by women because they're painting about things that we see around us that concern us that we can connect with. 
Um, and yet, even still, when you hear art gallery directors, you know, when people from the arts establishment um, are being interviewed and men, and, and these are men that you would think of as, as very modern and very supportive of women. And they're asked that question, you know, who are the artists who inspire you? Too often, they still go through man, 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 man. And you think, yes, these are all great artists, mm -hmm. but where are the women? Mm -hmm. You know, and then after the question of where are the women, where are the non-European mm -hmm. artists there? So right. things are improving, but but I'm still seeing that and being disappointed by that. And there's a lot of work to be done. You Absolutely. know, there's been a lot of work that's been done in corporate Australia to try and um, get that diversity that's required. To, to get a good, healthy business environment, you need diversity because you need people with different ideas and different experiences. Um, otherwise, you end up with this pack mentality and you have another global financial crisis because you've got all these <laughs> young, hyped up men taking unrealistic risks and nobody's sort of from a different point of view. Right. It's the same in art, you know, to have a healthy art market, you need diversity. And um, some of the most exciting um, kind of art that's that's happening in Australia at the moment is happening from people with you know all sorts of interesting backgrounds you know the um, the the female Aboriginal artists that that uh, there's this one artist that I was looking at recently uh, Sally Gabori it's fantastic she didn't start painting till she was I think 80 years of age wow. she came from a really really traditional Aboriginal background. She came from this particular area in Queensland that was one of the last to have a connection with Euro European people. Mm -hmm. And then at the um, age of about 80, she joined this sort of community art group and she came up with these absolutely fabulous, brightly coloured, very um, abstracted kind of paintings, very, very modern. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Last year, she had this big showing in Paris, and um, she's dead now, unfortunately. But she had a ten-year painting career because she she lived till she was about ninety-one, and um, it, just the most extraordinary work. And there, there's another guy whose whose name I've forgotten, who has a Sri Lankan background, who's doing these really really interesting ceramic works. Some of them are mechanized, and you know, it's it's so so you're getting these wonderful influences in in the art market that are coming from um not the traditional sources and i think that's a good thing but yeah we've still got a long way to go yeah yeah absolutely so fiona um like i said I, we've been talking for over an hour i am very very thankful that you joined me and on, on our chat and uh stay in touch if you would it's it's great getting this connection from the u.s to australia and and being able to talk the way we did. I mean, there's a lot of similarities in what we're doing and there's a lot of um, similar differences, I guess you could say, uh, between the markets and, and maybe even between the way we create. But you, there's so much similarity there that I, I think it, it was wonderful to hear from you and the, the different points of view. So thank you. Great, it's been lovely. Thank you for listening everyone and we'll catch you next time. Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us.